Divine Truth Events. These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series. And it is a question and answer session from people in Philadelphia. Presented by Jesus on the 19th of October 2013 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. This is session one, part two. Okay, who's next? <laughs> so, ooh, this works. My question is, I guess I'm a little angry with God. Yep, good. And it has to do with children. Yep. And him allowing them to suffer because of their own parents' laws of attractions and or spirits overcloaking them when they don't have the free will to, to make themselves better. And so I understand part of the upside is that they go to Summerland if they die young, which is great, um, but that's... It doesn't seem like that that's God's purpose to send kids directly to Summerland. Yep. It's to be on earth, to experience. And yet all these things that they cannot control through their own will, they're being subjected to. And it doesn't feel loving to me. Okay. Well, let's first look what happens when uh, we have a child, shall we? I firstly can understand you being... Um, when I say understand, I, you know, I get why you're angry with God on the subject. When you're angry with God... You just need to start allowing yourself to feel the anger you have with God for a start. And um, when you say because, duh, 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 you need to logically take your train of thought to its conclusion. And you're not doing that. Right? Who had the children? The parents did. Yeah. So the parent decided to have a child. Did God decide for the parent to have a child? No. No, God allowed the procreative ability to occur, but God didn't decide that you as a parent have to have a child. God never decided that. Did God decide upon the parent's condition? No. No. The parent has their own ability to exercise their own condition and grow or degrade their own condition through their choices. So can you see for a start, from a logical perspective, the parent made the decision to have the child and the parent's condition was also a decision. So if we look at the decisions, one was to have children. The second decision the parent made was to retain its own unloving condition. everything right here. Condition. In other words, the parent chose to remain in the same unloving condition before it had the child as after having a child. That's assumed that the parents knew that they were in that condition. I can't. Uh, see, I don't believe that no, anybody doesn't know. Well, you think about it. Like, how many times... Like, for example, I say... For example, I say smacking a child is a violent act towards a child. The average parent in the USA disagrees with me completely. In fact, I would suggest that 99% of parents in the USA disagree completely with that statement. 70% of them are religious and believe that smacking a child is God's instruction. Right? Now... I can come along and say smacking a child is an unloving act, but the parent's belief to retain the idea or concept that smacking a child is a loving act is the parent's own choice. And they are making that own choice. In fact, they get very angry when you tell them that smacking the child is an unloving act. They get very angry. So that tells me that the parent wants to retain the unloving position, not that it wasn't outside of their choice. Do you but, follow me? 
Yeah, but it's like what you don't know, you don't know. I mean, no, if I a don't parent know about that. doesn't. If How they... does it feel if I be beat you across your legs? If I laid you on the ground right. Right, and got a stick and beated you across the legs, would you be happy with that decision? No, no but no. I'm just saying that parents, if they believe something, they don't even, allow, they don't even think that there's another possibility. Yeah, but until... that, even what they think is their responsibility. So you're, you're trying to take away the responsibility of the parent's choice by saying, oh, but they don't know, but they do. All they've got to do is do one thing, and that is think ethically. All they've got to do is think, as I said in the first century, how would you like to be treated? Then treat other people how you'd like to be treated. Do you like to be beaten with a stick? No. In your country here, you call that assault. If it happens, if an adult gets a stick and beats you with it, you call that assault. But if an adult gets a child and beats the stick on the child, you call that parenting. Now, there's something wrong. Now, I do not believe that any parent who examines those two particular things from the perspective of what would I like done to me would, know, would be able to see the difference. And I, I'm quite certain that they would be easily able to determine that what I'm saying is true on that particular subject. But the reality is they don't want to. And that's the use of their will. Right? Now, we, what, what we want to do, and this is something that we've got to be very careful doing, is we want to blame God, so he's God up here, for what the parent chose to do. That's what we want to do. We want to blame God for what the parent chose. Now, I see some very big logical and also emotional flaws with doing such a thing. From a logical perspective, if God gives the parent free will, then that allows the parent to make its own decisions. But God also has a whole heap of laws that require the responsibility for such decisions to be placed upon the soul of the parent. Does that make sense? So while the parent has the ability to make the decision, they also have the responsibility, from God's perspective, for the outcome. So God does not attribute the damage done to a child to the child. God attributes it to the parent's soul. But the child suffers. The child may suffer temporarily by the way, not permanently. The child may suffer. But even the choice to make the child suffer is made by the parent's decision, not God's. God doesn't want the child to suffer. The parent does. And we, in most Western societies, and in fact most societies on earth, we are not attributing the decisions towards the person who is responsible. And this is one reason why many of us are not getting into our emotions about our, parent, uh, our upbringing. Because we don't want to attribute the bad things that happened during our childhood to our parents. We don't want to make them responsible for the choices they made. We want to make God responsible for the choices our parents made. Does that make sense? And... That in itself is a flawed logical position. The person who is responsible is the person who makes the decision, not anyone else. So God gave us the gift to be able to procreate. Parents can use that decision to procreate in a loving way or they can use that gift to procreate in an unloving way. That is their choice. It's like me giving you a knife and you can use that to cut up your veggies and prepare your meal in a loving way or you can use it to harm yourself or harm someone else. You can do either. Now God has done this with almost every gift that God's given us. So God gave us the gift of sexuality, another gift. We can use it in a loving way and experience pleasure or we can use it in an unloving way and experience a lot of pain. We can even use it in an unloving way and eventually have terrible diseases and die from them. That's how far it can go. 
And we have the complete choice to take any direction. The complete free will decision rests upon us, our responsibility. Every time we blame God for something that parents do, we are taking the responsibility away from the parents and placing the responsibility on God who doesn't want the parents to do those things in the first place. That's what we're doing. And we're doing it for an emotional reason. So what could be the emotional reason why we would like to take the responsibility away from the parent and put it back on God? Well, there's only probably one or two real good emotional reasons. One is some of us are parents and we don't want to feel the responsibility ourselves. And the other one is we have a lot of pain from what our parents chose to do and we don't want to feel that pain. So we would like to blame God for the pain that our parents created. That's what we do. But that is just an avoidance of specific emotions. In the end, that's the, that's the underlying emotional reason that drives us into blaming God for something that somebody else is responsible for. The reality is the person who makes the decision bears the responsibility. God made this beautiful system where if you make the decision, you bear the responsibility. On earth, all of us try to get away with that. You think in your own culture, and it's the same in our culture in Australia, how many times we try to get away with a certain responsibility of taking a certain action. You know, there's whole law teams of lawyers helping people get away with the responsibility of their own actions. You know? We call it defence. It's not defence. It's helping people get away from having to take any responsibility for their choices in many cases. And we do this all the time because we want to get away with things. <laughs> we do. If you're honest with yourself, in the course of a day or a few days of your life, think about how many times you want to get away with something that, that you wouldn't really like anybody else to get away with. Right. So if you're speeding, how many of you speed? Everyone, okay. Pretty close to. So, so we're speeding and we have an accident. What's the law state under those circumstances here in the USA? Basically, it makes you mostly culpable for the accident, doesn't it? But how many of us want to get away with that? We, we want to speed and also not take responsibility for the actions that speeding causes. That's what we want to do. We are constantly in avoidance of law. Does that make sense? So, so the way God has made the universal system is you cannot avoid law. God made this beautiful law-based system, all based on love, and, and we need to conform with it. But the reality is the majority of us on earth want to get away with it. We want to get away with law. You look at our day-to-day -day life, we're often trying to get away with it, right? If you think about it, we're often trying to get away with things. And that demonstrates the level of rebellion we have towards law, which is basically an anger, right? An anger towards law. We don't want to be governed by law. This is the thing that caused us to make decisions that are unloving. We don't want to be governed by loving laws. We want to think that what we want should go. But the problem with any unloving law is that it always damages someone else. Sorry, the problem with any unloving decision we make is that it always damages someone else. Always. And we often don't want to take, bear the responsibility of that damage because we feel guilty, we feel ashamed, and we feel other emotions that we need to feel, but we choose to avoid those emotions too. And so what we often do with parenting is that we want to avoid the guilt associated with making the decision that, that then bears certain responsibilities. And so what we do is we, we come up with our gods to blame for it all. And that helps us personally get away with a whole lot of things that God is going to attribute it to you personally as a parent. But it also helps you get away with the emotions involved in what was done to you by your own parents. In other words, you're willing to forgive your parent as long as you put all the blame on God rather than your parent. Right? And what I'm suggesting is that's not forgiving your parent either. That's just shifting the blame from someone who is responsible to someone who isn't for their actions. 
And we often want to do that ourselves in our own life as well. We want to often shift the blame away from ourselves onto someone else, someone often who we can't touch and we can't feel and we can't get, you know, that someone who's not going to build us back if we, <laughs> if we uh, acknowledge it. So, so in other words, we often want to blame God because we know God's not going to come down and punish us. God's not going to come down and beat us up because of our blame of him. God's not going to do all of those things. So what we, what we finish up doing is we blame God for a lot of things. And, it, and we do it for emotional reasons inside of ourselves. I feel God's made a perfect system when it comes to decision and responsibility. We use our will in harmony with God's love. There is never going to be a negative result, ever. If we use our will out of harmony with God's love, there will always be a negative result, of which we bear the responsibility. And that's a perfect system. What we have on earth is a very imperfect system. Often I bear the responsibility for something you did or somebody else bears the responsibility for something you did. It's not very fair, but it often happens like that. Yeah. So the, soul, um, the spirits overcloaking, that's really the parents' responsibility because of their... It's not just the parents' responsibility, no. If a spirit is overcloaking the parent and influencing the parent to harm the child then whatever influence the spirit brought to bear is their responsibility. Their soul will degrade in its condition as a result of their responsibility. Everything that God has done attributes responsibility to the people involved. Does that make sense? Right. But the, the, the child is suffering if the spirit is overcloaking the child. If the spirit is overcloaking the child then the parent bears the responsibility for that overcloaking occurring and the spirit bears the responsibility for that overcloaking occurring. But the child suffers. I agree. But if the parent cared or the spirit cared, the child wouldn't suffer. They'd stop overcloaking. But I just feel like it's so unloving for the child to bear the responsibility for the parent and the no. spirit. It's not bearing the responsibility. Okay, the pain. The pain is not the responsibility. No, the child bearing the pain. The child has an emotion, a feeling of pain. And if you, if you as a loving parent saw that, you would want to stop it, surely. It's only because the parent is not loving that it never stops. Do you, do you understand? It's only because the parent or the spirit has chosen to be unloving that this child's suffering be begins and stays. It's not for any other reason. It's not because of something God did. It's because of something these people do. It's like what I see frequently occurring is this, um, this sort of viewpoint that if I am bad to you, that it's somehow either your fault or it's somebody else's fault who allowed me to be bad to you. The reality is it's none of those things. It's actually my fault because I've chosen to be bad to you. I've chosen to be unloving to you. It's my fault. So any suffering that the child experiences is the fault of the person who created the suffering. It's not God's fault. Now, how, with all the connection that we have with each other, how can God prevent that? The only way God could prevent the suffering of the child is by forcing the will of the parent to do something different. Which would mean that the parent no longer has the right to make its own decisions. Which means that the parent would no longer be a free will individual. So God would have to break its own gift in order to stop the parent from harming the child, would it not? So you can see that the problem with such reasoning is that God would have to break a whole heap of gifts, which are all beautiful gifts given to humanity, in order to prevent this child from suffering. God would have to intervene and become selective with the way in which the gift is given. And God doesn't do that. God has given the gift to the parent and the child and the spirit. All of them equally have the same gift, the gift to make a choice or a decision. 
The only problem for the child is, while the child's during its formative years, the parents and the adults are responsible for most of the decisions of the pain of what occurs to that child. And they should be responsible. They should be, because they are the ones creating most of the child's pain and suffering. So they should be responsible. And if they were truly responsible, and they knew it, they would surely want to stop it, if they were loving. But the problem is, we don't want to stop a lot of things. We don't. The reality in, in your country here, I think it is, um, isn't it there's close to, well, worldwide, there's close to 50 million abortions every year. Right? That's 50 million children who have their will removed from them before they're even born by parents who all think they have a good reason for doing so. Right? All of them think that. They all th believe they have a good reason for doing that. Now, when the child is born, there's in this country, there's 200 million parents who believe that it's right to spank the child. In other words, there's 200 million parents who believe that it's right to commit a violent act towards a child who cannot defend itself. And yet those same people... Those, I don't know what's happening with all that, but I might move my pack the other side. I don't know if it's going to help anything there. And yet those same people, interestingly, if they themselves were hit or abused in some way, in the ve very same way that they've chose, chosen to abuse their own children, they would defend it in court to the hilt that it was wrong, that the action was wrong. Now, like, we can argue that God created a system that allowed that, right? which is true, God did. God created a system which allowed that through giving us the gift of free will. But then to attribute the blame of the parents' actions towards God, that, that is very, very damaging. Now, now, if you think about it, it is religions who created the concept that it's okay that God wants you to spank your own children. So who bears the responsibility for the creation of pain for the child who gets spanked as a result of the concept? the actual religious leaders who created the concept. Even though they don't have any children of their own, God will attribute to them every bit of pain that every single child has experienced as a result of their belief system and their, and their teaching. So the thing we don't realise here on earth is that there is an equalisation in the spirit world of all of these things. Do you understand what I mean by that? Not terribly. No. Most, most people don't understand that many things are compensated for as a result of um, God's laws that are enacted in the spirit world as a result of what, from the result of what happened here on earth. In other words, if a child right, was beaten by its parent and the parent believed that the reason why it was doing so was because God was saying that it should do it, right? And the parent believed that because a minister told the parent that that is the truth, right? Now, each person bears some responsibility, these two adults, bears responsibility of what's happened. And the religion behind this minister, which is a collective made up of people who have made theological decisions, they all bear responsibility for teaching the minister such a thing, of course. And the way God's laws work is that every single person has whatever they have um, demonstrated to other people reflected upon their own soul. So, so every single minister who is involved in the creation of the concept that it was okay for this minister to teach that the Bible says that you should spank the child, so you should spank the child. And then this minister felt that strongly enough, even though he might have, have children of his own, to teach the parent such a thing. And the parent then chose to believe such a stupid thing. And it is a stupid thing, if you think about it, from a logical perspective. The parent chose to believe such a stupid thing about God, but also about what's ethical, and chose to punish the child. The child would be compensated in its future for every one of those decisions. In other words, 
things that the chose cho- child chose to do it, with using its own free will that were dependent upon all of these other things happening to it will not be attributed to the child but will actually be attributed to the parent and the religion and the, and the minister. And this is why I said in the first century, if you're going to be a teacher, you bear a very serious responsibility. Now, a parent is a teacher. So you bear, every parent bears serious responsibility for what you teach another person, right? So let's say this child decides at some point in its future to act out this now violent aggression that's occurred to it in some way. That won't be attributed to the child unless the child has got to the point where it can make its own decisions. Then it's attributed to the child. And, and what age do you think that is? Well, that depends on the child and it depends on the circumstances. Some children have been beaten into submission so much, but by the time they're 50, they're still not making their own decisions. Right? Other children have been given a fair degree of latitude and freedom. By the time they're seven, they're making all their own decisions. It just depends... <laughs> on the child and the circumstances surrounding the child, right? But there are, there are 50-year-olds or 70-year-olds that I've seen still not making their own decisions. Well, you look at the average person who's in part of a religion. Are they making their own decisions? Yeah. Sometimes yes, on some issues, but on other issues, sometimes not. They're being told what to do by a minister or a religious faith and they blindly follow it. Right? So how much of that can you attribute to the person? There's a certain percentage, obviously, because they have an adult, they have a reasoning mind, they're able to determine what they feel is loving compared to what they act. In other words, they're able to feel that if they were laid down on the ground and beaten with a stick, that it would hurt and it would be uncomfortable and it wouldn't be very nice and it would feel terrible. So if they're able to feel that, then they have some level of understanding of their own responsibility that they bear when they beat their own child, right? But not all of the responsibility is that parents because he's had a religious faith behind him teaching him that such a thought is fine. And in fact, such a thought is God's, bears God's approval. And who taught him that? A whole group of people who wanted control over people's faith and wanted control over people's lives and who wanted control. And they bear in the spirit world the responsibility. So many of them are still in the hells. That they've, been a, they've been a minister all their life and they arrive in the depths of hell in the spirit world and they bear the responsibility of every single piece of pain that has occurred, that has been created as a result of their teaching. You imagine what that's like. So in other words, a minister who created the whole concept bears the responsibility for huge amounts of pain that he'll have to at some point work through and work through and this is why many ministers in the spirit world are still in the hells because they refuse to bear the responsibility of that pain and that's why they're still there so can i ask a follow-on sure so i I get that it's the parent's responsibility not god's um so say then a child comes and they're they've got emotional issues and other issues um and those children are then adopted into another home yep or is, is that real, the, the new parents? Is, is there a law, a, a law of attraction there? There's a law of attraction there, surely. Okay. You know, obviously, if you attracted another, a child from another family coming into your home, there's some obviously very pure desires inside of yourself. Mm-hmm. And you also may have different injuries inside of yourself that cause the attraction of a specific child with certain injuries as well. But love would always overcome those injuries in the end. And so I don't see, uh, everything's based on attractions, but I don't see the problem of that so much. But once that child is attracted, it doesn't mean that everything that child does is now attributed to the new parent because the child's had a history with its old parent, even if that history has only been five days and the gestation period of the pregnancy. And there is a history of a certain emotional absorption of of different attitudes and beliefs and so forth that have occurred that will still be attributed to the old parent parents in terms of the child's actions does it make sense yeah yeah but at some point we all must understand one basic truth and that is we all get to a point eventually and this applies generally on earth unless there is some kind of intellectual disability we all get to the point eventually where we bear responsibility 
for all of our decisions or the majority of them. And we all have the ability to analyse whether behaviour is loving or unloving. And we often avoid the responsibility of such analysis. In other words, we choose to ignore analysing whether our behaviour is loving or unloving. We just choose to do something that's unloving because we have selfish motivations for doing so. And we don't choose to and analyse whether these things, and particularly this thing, love, has been the guiding factor of our choice. One of the best ways that you can progress is to actually learn what's loving and then do it, no matter what. No matter how afraid you are, no matter how little faith you have, just do it anyway, no matter what. That's one of the best things you can do, because your emotions will get triggered in that, you'll have to be humble doing that. There'll be a lot of things that come up as a result of doing that. It is one, of the, one way that you can progress, is by seeing what you know is loving and choosing to do it no matter what the results. Right? Now, all of us have that ability to make that choice and decision. We all do. And every time we blame God for a choice that somebody else has made, we are choosing to not place responsibility, the burden of responsibility for the action upon the person. And if you look at our legal system, we do that constantly. We choose to take responsibility away from the people who actually perpetrated the act. If we look at, if we look at our laws, many of them take responsibility from, away from the person who chose to act. If we look at what we do in the family, you see this happening very frequently in the family where parents take responsibility away from the person who chose to act badly. We see it happening with regard to finances in particular, where people get themselves in terrible, serious trouble financially, and we choose to bail them out, get them out of it, not take responsibility for their actions. We, we do it with regard to love constantly. If you walk into the average supermarket when you go shopping, you will find at least one person treating a shop assistant unlovingly, you know, getting angry with them or whatever. And what does the shop assistant do? It serves that person first. It, 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 it does everything it can. Why? Because it, we, we want to take the responsibility away from the person who's being unloving. If, if we were truly being responsible and helping the other person be responsible, any person that was angry in the shop, we just wouldn't serve them. For any reason. But that's not treating others how you'd want to be treated yourself. No, it is. Do you want to engage with an angry person? So why would you allow an angry person to engage with you? Why would you allow yourself to be angry engaging with another person? See, I feel that's ethical. See, if you went to my shop and you were angry with me, you wouldn't get served. And, and, it, and it wouldn't worry me what cost I had to pay for that. If I had to go to court for that, if I had to, like, if I had to just endure your abuse, none of that would worry me. You're just not going to get served while you're angry. <laughs> That's it. Does that make sense? Because I'm giving you a gift of my service. Right? I would never be angry with you if you were serving me. So why would I put up with you being angry with me while I'm serving you? Right? You can see, again, ethical behaviour refl reflected or flipped over is exactly the same. Like, I have just as much right, from God's perspective, if you, if you look at it more, more purely, I have just as much responsibility to be loving as you do. That means you have just as much responsibility to be loving as I do. Both are the same. We are both equal in God's eyes. If we're both equal in God's eyes, then I need to be as loving as I can possibly be, and I need to expect that you should be too. And if you chose not to be, I wouldn't put up with the behaviour. This is why lately I've just been removing people who are projecting rage at me in my talks. You're projecting rage at me, I kick you out. Sometimes I've had to call the police to kick a person out. But that's the way it goes. Like I wouldn't sit in an audience and project rage at a person who's giving me their time for free. So why, would I, why do I have to put up with somebody else doing it? If I'm ethical, I would not put up with anybody doing it. Even Mary doing it, I wouldn't put up with. 
Now, if Mary's projecting rage at me during a talk, I'd kick her out too. <laughs> Does that make sense? It doesn't matter who it is. It's ethical to treat each person the same because we all have the same value. Right? This is how God deals with all of us. God treats us all the same even, and we all have the same value. So our children have the same value to God as you have. Not more and not less. It quite often, there's a car sign that you can buy in Australia that says, children aboard, be careful. And I'm going, there's adults aboard, be careful. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They have the same value from God's perspective. There's only one difference with a child, and that is a child can't always make its own choices and decisions and therefore does not bear the responsibility as much as a parent as to its own choices and decisions because it's being forced to do things by adults. So, so this is, God attributes all of that automatically. All of God's laws attribute it automatically. When you notice all of this happening from a spiritual perspective, you go, wow, what a system. It's, a, it's such a powerful system. We have modified it on earth and then called it all sorts of things on earth. We have created religious systems that are in complete disagreement with it on earth. Like the whole concept that I bear the responsibility for your sins, that Jesus bears the responsibility for your sins, is completely out of harmony with what I've just said. No, every one of God's children bear the responsibility for their own decisions. I don't bear any responsibility whatsoever for your decisions. Unless I've placed you in a situation where I've forced you somehow to make that decision. Then I bear some responsibility. Right? But I don't bear the responsibility otherwise. And God is going to attribute to each child the responsibility for their decisions. Now, when a child is formative during the first, particularly his first seven years... The responsibility is the result of the teacher of the child. Just like this teacher, the minister, bears responsibility for some of the parents' belief systems. Because if he's teaching something that's false, then the parent is absorbing something that is false and then engaging them. Right? But each person in the end, if they, had the, if they had an internal system of ethics, they would go, okay, does this, is this what I would like to have done to me? If it's not what I would like to have done to me, then I, I can't do that to somebody else. Yeah. And that's why you know, the golden rule, something that I stated in, that's now recorded in the Bible, was recorded because it's such an important concept to understand. Yeah, very important concept. And, and in fact, helps you determine what's loving and what isn't. Usually anything you don't like is quite often things that you demand of others. And that, that demonstrates a lack of ethics. Right? And this, God doesn't do any of that. God always attributes responsibility to the person who made the decision. God is not unbalanced in any of the ethical relationships that God has with any of her children. And as a result of that, each parent who made a decision is going to have to bear the consequences of what they chose to do after that decision was made. Thank you. So um, recently we did a series, started a series of frequently asked questions about parenting, parents and children. I don't know if you've seen that yet. But um, a, a guy in Australia, his name is Justin Crick, did that with me. And by about the third or fourth question, Justin's also getting to the point where he's going, and he asks another question, and, he goes, and the answer every time, because like, he's got two children of his own, and uh, the answer every time was just very triggering, because... It, because this particular concept is not a concept that even many parents understand. And uh, we don't understand it oftentimes because our parents didn't understand it and so forth. But once you start presenting the truth of it, it makes logical sense. But emotionally, it's really difficult to engage in a full manner until you start understanding the importance of responsibility. And God wants you to be responsible for your own life. Remember, this is one of the most important questions you can ask, how you use your will. One of, it's one of the five main things you can ask about. And how a parent treats a child always revol revolves around how the parent is using its will. Yep. And as such, it bears a lot of responsibility. Yeah. 
if we use our will in a loving manner, we will neither pander to the child. In other words, we won't create a monster out of the child who's just demanding everything, which a lot of parents are doing nowadays. Neither will we violently act towards the child. We will correct them in a loving manner, just the way God corrects us. And, but we won't put up with any crap, as the saying goes. We will, we will be very firm in the manner in which we draw the line and how we bear, you know, how the child bears the consequence. Because we, in the end, we want to teach this child the whole idea or concept of responsibility, of bearing the consequence of its own decisions. We want to do that. We don't want to take away from the child the consequence of its own decisions because then it grows up to be a parent who wants to blame God. <laughs> Does that make sense? It needs to be a parent who takes full responsibility for its own actions. Yeah. And, and this is the beautiful thing, is that once we understand these particular principles, we understand that actually God is not responsible for how this child was treated. Now, God is very compassionate to these children. In fact, any child who passes into the spirit world who has been damaged by the result of parents' actions, whether it doesn't matter how violent they personally have become themselves, if they're still a child, they are treated in summer land, in generally isolation until they can be placed with other children by a group of people who assist them to work through the emotions that have caused them to have so much pain. So they're actually given a lot more love than any person on earth would be able to give them. And, or unfortunately, because the reality is all of us could potentially give that kind of love here on earth, but, but they're given a lot of love and a lot of help to get beyond the emotions. Far more help than an adult who has harmed other people would be given, in fact. And the reason why is because the child has not been responsible for the creation of this pain that's now in them. Somebody else has. However, the child does have to go through the process of experiencing it. And there's one really good reason for that. And that is that each of us cannot feel the feelings of another. So once a feeling has entered us, nobody else can release it for us. That's the unfortunate thing of this damage. This is why God has attributed so much responsibility to the persons who teach. Because the, the problem is, once the damage is done inside of the individual, the only way for this damage to be released is by going through the emotional experience. Now, that is a painful process, but only the individual can do it. With God's help, with God's love, they can do it very much more rapidly, but only the individual can allow that process. So I have to feel my own emotions. This is one reason why God puts so much responsibility on the people who created my emotions, because in the end, I'm going to have to feel the results of my own emotions at some point that somebody else has created. And... The reason why that has been is because that way each of us learn that we are completely able to have a certain emotional condition independent of another person. So in other words, Michael can be as bad as he wants to be towards me and I can feel nothing as a result of it. And I can actually get to a point where I can just feel love as a result of it. If Michael was able to transmit all of his evil emotions, sorry about that, Michael, <laughs> he's not that bad, all of his evil emotions at me and I had to feel them, then that would mean that I would now no longer be an individual who is able to have its own emotions, but rather I would have to absorb the emotions from Michael of his own behaviour. That would be terrible, because that means that I'd be completely at the whim of every single person around me as to what I experience. So the reason why God has created us this way is so that we can be an individual emotionally. Does that make sense? We can go through our own individual emotional experience with independent of anyone else in the universe. And God created that potential so that you could be the only person in the celestial heaven on earth, if you wanted to be. Does that make sense? You could be the only person who, who is a happy and has no cares, no worries, no completely self-responsible for every decision 
and completely loving in every decision. And you can be like that even though the rest of the world could be terrible. Right? But the downside of that, of course, of that creation, is that when a child is just imposed upon emotionally by its parents and other belief systems, then the child has some pain to experience that it has to choose to experience for itself if it's ever going to be clear of it. That's the downside of it. But there's a lot of upsides to it as well. And that is that the child can go through all of those things and the adult can go through all of those things and be a complete individual independent of what everybody else goes through. And that's a very positive part of that particular principle. So everything that God does is like this. There's all these gifts that God gives us. And if we work out of harmony with love, there's all these negative consequences. If we work in harmony with love, there's all these beautiful positive consequences. And the consequences tell us whether we're in or out of harmony with love. It's the consequences that tell us that. Yeah. And what I love about the system that God has created is that as long as I am prepared to feel about the consequence of using my will, I can independently grow from any other being in God's universe. So that means that I can be loving even if nobody else is. Right. And that is a beautiful thing if you think about it because it means that I am not dependent upon the choices of other people. So while the child is dependent, the adult is no longer dependent on the choice of other people. And any time the child has been dependent and has been damaged, the damage will be attributed to the other people and the child will be given a dispensation for that particular dependence. In other words, the child will not have to go through the same compensatory effects of the results as the parent will for perpetrating the action. So the system allows for a loving Got to find out which one's coming from. There's a lot of very angry spirits about that particular discussion as well. Um, which you can understand, like a lot of them believe that they should get away with certain actions, right? And that it's not the case at all. We never get away with anything that we choose to do that's out of harmony with God's love, ever. You have two choices. You either compensate for it or you repent for it. That's all you have. Once you've done the action, you've got two choices. You either compensate or you repent. A person who doesn't repent has to compensate for everything. So the... Religious leaders who created the belief that it's right for a parent to punish the child, they will have to compensate for every single child's pain that has occurred as a result of that belief until they become repentant for their particular teaching. When they become repentant for the particular teaching, they are relieved of the burden of compensation. Right. So they have a choice. They either compensate for, the, for how long it takes to compensate, and for some of them it's thousands of years it's going to be, right? Or they repent, one of the two. They've got no other choice, there's no third option. And that's the beautiful thing about all of God's laws is that there is no third option. <laughs> Black, white, that's it, cut and dried. <laughs> you know where you stand every time and it's the same for every person if they take the same action for the same reason. And that's the way you'd want it to be, isn't it? If you were living in a perfect world. And that's the way God's created God's system. Okay, what's the time? 5.15, still got a quarter of an hour. Who would like to ask another question? Straight behind you. Hi. I'll just rub this off and then I can face you. First off, thank you very much for... Um, all you guys, all the things you guys are doing, it's definitely changed my life big time. So That's great. Um, thank yeah. you. Um, so over the past few weeks, I think um, I've had some, I think like with the government shutdown and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, et cetera. Yep. Um, obviously, I've done a lot of introspection and I have had a lot of introspection in my life in general. Yeah, that's uh, good. Um, I've had some, I guess, some anger again, kind of raise up a little bit. Yep. But can, I mean, can it's I kind ask of it's what a, you're angry about. Well, I, I guess very similar, I guess, to the other questions that were just kind of preceding, which was 
it just seems like there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering going on. And, there is. And um, it just seems like it could have been easier somehow, you know. And <laughs> yes, it could have been. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, one of the questions, and I have another um, quick question after this too, if I, if there's time. Um, I think you had mentioned that in the first century you had you didn't have your parents' um, injuries. Is that right? Or something was different. And the prime injury that I didn't have in the first century was the injury of self-worth. So the majority of children on earth today, their worth is dependent upon their parents' worth. Does that make sense? Like, and what their parent, how much worth their parent felt for the child. Whereas in the first century, my parents were the average parents. You know, my father was the, probably the average man in the first century. He was quite a violent character at times. He would often try to punish me for things that I didn't do and for things that I did do that he thought were not what I should be, you know, so he often did that. My mother, she was a little different. She was a bit more gentler. But, of course, she became harder as her life became harder and emotionally she became harder. And it was only once she started receiving divine love that she became soft again. And so I grew up in the sort of average environment for a first century life. In that process, the environment was such that um, I, if, I was the, was, if I had the same opinions of myself that my parents had of me, I would have found life very, very difficult to work through emotional issues. And in fact, pretty much impossible. So what I feel God did with me, and this is a feeling that, uh, of what I feel God did with me, is gave me worth at the time of my birth. So during my conception, I was the same as any other person. I was connected to my mother, therefore absorbing my mother and father's emotions. And even the impurities were coming through her bloodstream and all, all the other things were still happening normally. As soon as I was born and disconnected from the umbilical cord of my mother, um, the feeling that I had was a feeling of having worth. That was the only feeling that was different from anything that you would have experienced. In other words, and when I say it's the only thing, it's a huge thing. Right? Because you think about it, the, if you think about it, the average person, the main reason why they take many of the decisions or make many of the decisions they make is because of a lack of self-worth. They believe other people when you shouldn't believe them. And they accept what other people tell them when you shouldn't accept it, and so forth. I didn't have that problem. So right from a very young age, I didn't accept my parents' viewpoint of life. Does that make sense? Um, now, of course, it's been very different this life for me because I've gone through a completely different process, but that's what happened in the first century. I didn't take on my parents' viewpoint of me. Because of that, I had the ability to think far more clearly about what was right and what was wrong from a love perspective than the average person of my day that my day had in my day. Because of that, even though I had a lot of damage perpetrated towards me, so my father still belted me every time he believed, and sometimes quite violently, every time he believed that I did the wrong thing, I didn't blame myself for the belting. Does that make sense? I knew that it was him who was out of harmony with love. He was being violent. Whenever I was pulled down or condescended to by another person, I didn't feel that I was as bad as what they were saying because I could feel it was their problem, their viewpoint of me, not God's viewpoint of me. Now, that made a huge difference to every choice that I made. But I could have chosen differently still. So every time I was beaten by my father, I could have chosen and got angry. I could have still chosen that. But because I didn't have, a, I didn't have low self-esteem, I didn't choose to do that. I could see it was his problem and not my own. Make sense? Yeah. Do you, do you feel that there are um, and have been other people that have had that, but just different, you know, their lives just made them not quite as focused on God or love? 
Um, no, I don't um, believe that there's been another person who had that gift from God, if you like. Somebody had to have it uh, in order for um, true change to happen on the earth. So I feel God sort of provided that particular gift. But I also had to make a heap of choices that were right as well. So I had to you know, do the decision thing. I could have chosen differently. I could have. On literally thousands of occasions... I was treated very violently through my entire life by lots of different people and I could have chosen differently. But, but I had a very strong feeling about wanting to be close to God, wanting to be in harmony with love and so forth. So I chose to live in harmony with that. I still could have chosen differently. But what I'm saying is the feeling that I had at the time I was born or shortly after was that I was not to blame for what was perpetrated at me. Does that make sense? And that made a huge difference to um, my ability to make clear choices and decisions. Mind you, Ammon and Amman had the same ability and they still chose to act out of harmony with love. So just because a person has that ability, it doesn't mean they could choose a negative thing. But in my case, I chose to act more positively. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess the frustration for me is that I, I wish that you know, it'd be nice, I think, if everybody had that. And number two, it'd be nice if, like, if not everybody had it, then I'm okay with maybe once every century one person comes and does that and <laughs> yeah. has that, you know, like, yeah, yeah. just as a constant reminder or, you know. And Mary wants to comment about it, so. <laughs> Do I need to turn this mic off while I'm in between talks or? Sorry? Do I need to turn the mic off in no, between? No, okay. it makes the noise is not coming through the, the sound. It's coming through the what's called the radio frequency, and there's nothing much I can do about that. It means that somebody's got some transmission equipment that's interfering with ours, so I'm going to have to change those frequencies. Yeah. But I don't even know which frequency I'm using that's causing the problem at this point. Mm. So, yeah, fire away, back. Uh, I just wanted to um, make mention, I think a lot of people... Uh, regard AJ's life, well, Jesus' life in the first century as a special case. You know, he had this special thing happen and therefore he could be at one with God on earth. And while I'm sure he would admit that it helped him, <laughs> uh, as he just pointed out, he had to make a lot of decisions. Um, and I had a more will. violent life than the average person in the first century. Because the average person in the first century conceded with everyone around them. In other words, they agreed with everyone around them. When you agree with people around you, you, definitely, you generally can avoid a lot of violence, right? Well, I didn't agree with anyone around me, including my own parents. So from a very young age, I had a lot of violence perpetrated towards me as a result. So there, there were certainly negative things that happened to me as a result. Does that make sense? Oh, so that gift was given, but the way in which uh, I, could have, I could have chosen to use it completely differently. Yep. And I suppose the, the thing I wanted to say about right now, right now in history, uh, is that this is very historical, that AJ didn't have that gift this time. And I still feel that very few people see the um, powerful way in which he uses his will constantly to demonstrate possibilities to all of us. Um, we, in the first century, I didn't have that gift from God um, and I didn't make as much progress as he did on earth. But right now, we had a level playing field and he still um, takes my breath away with how much he has embodied those five principles um, against a lot of adversity I mean, I know your life now hasn't been as violent as it was in the first century, but it's a pretty... You face a lot of fear of violence by standing up internationally and globally and saying who you are. And I, I really feel that you're in the presence of someone who has challenged so much fear and really looked at himself and done so much personal work and... Um, I feel often still people are waiting for a better example or show me something more. Just be at one with God and then I'll do it. And um, if you really examine the life of this guy, you see something very, very powerful and uh, it's inspiring. 
And I often think if people just ask you more about how you live your life uh, and the way I see, you know, you would see there's so much there as an example already. Thanks, darling. I'll, I'll pay you for that later. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And I just wanted to one um, maybe lighter subject. Um, I think you also mentioned that you weren't too sure about this um, this uh, question or uh, idea or concept, but uh, considering you know you have studied much more on God than I or anybody else has, um, I know you don't have the answer potentially, but what do you suppose God came from? I have got no idea. Yeah. Of course, um, the more closer you get to God, you have, you know, you have ideas in terms of concepts, I, I would call them, rather than ideas, but I, I can't validate any, any of them. And so I feel that it's impossible for me to discuss them at length with anybody um, because they're really where God, the question of where God came from, I feel in the long run is probably going to be the last question that I get to answer. And if that's the case, given an, an infinite existence, it's going to be some time before I get to know the answer to that question, right? Um, if you think logically about it, um, for example, you, you have a car, right? Um, somebody created that car, but does the car know its creator? Like, really know it? From the, does a car experience its creator? The car, if the creator happens to be the driver, experiences some of the creator. But it's like saying, like asking a question about where did God come from is sort of almost saying like the car knowing where, where the person who create, designed the car came from. And, and that's, I feel that's the level of intelligence I have about where God came from. It was next to zero. <laughs> and, uh, and to be honest, I don't know whether I'm ever going to actually answer the question. Um, it has been a question that I've spent a little bit of time um, examining, but I'm more focused on experiencing God's nature and personality than I am on trying to understand everything about God. Because the reason why is I feel it's completely illogical for me to try to attempt to understand everything about God from a non-experiential perspective. Um, and can I say why? From a logical perspective, God is an infinite being. If God created an infinite universe and, and has an infinite amount of love, then it would make sense that God is, must be, from my concept of God, an infinite being. Now, if, if God is an infinite being and I am a finite being, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult for me, without receiving a part of God's nature, to understand more about God. Because it's like the finite trying to understand the infinite. Does that make sense? Now, as I receive God's love, I'm receiving a substance that comes from part of God's nature. So as I receive this love, I start to understand some of the principles of the infinite. But to understand the being that created the infinite himself or herself is, is like far beyond my imagination as to what I could understand about that particular thing at the moment. And, and when I'm saying far beyond, I'm talking about like millions and millions of years' time, I might come close to even understanding some of the bits about the question you've asked. Does that make sense? I, the difference between asking the question and feeling God is that after a while, the question almost pales into insignificance when it comes to feeling God. So the feelings you can get from God um, and the relationship you have with God takes precedence over anything you could ask about God herself and it's the relationship with God that tells you everything about God's nature and personality. So I can say I know God, but I don't know certain things about God. And some of the things about God, I feel I will never potentially know. Bearing in mind that God's an infinite being, as I currently understand it to be. 
And, and if that's the case, I've got to firstly focus my attention on what I'm capa- I have the capacity to understand first. Does that make sense? Now, as I receive God's love, I have a stronger capacity to understand lots of things. So you'll be amazed as you receive more and more of God's love how rapidly you understand some things in the universe in comparison to the average person. Because as you receive God's love, it opens up your soul and grows your soul in such a way that new pathways, you could think of them almost as new neural pathways in your brain, but they're actually in your soul, get established that enable you to have understandings that you couldn't previously have if you had developed only your intellect. But that all being said, since God's love is infinite, it would make sense that I will never be able to fully receive all of God's love without becoming God myself. And I don't believe that is going to be possible. Now, I don't know whether it's not going to be possible. I just don't believe it at the moment. Does that make sense? So God may have made a way in which all of us eventually can become like God in a true sense. In other words, God may have made a way, and I do believe this is possible potentially, that God has made a way for all of us to eventually become God-like in the sense that we all have souls that are children and we have billions of them and we all create universes of our own that we manage. Does that make sense? I do believe that is possible. But I don't know how much... Even once I've gone through all of that experience, I don't know how much I'll understand about God who created me still. You understand? And I am not certain that anybody will, um, actually. And God certainly doesn't need it. Um, God doesn't need us to understand God. God just desires to share love and other understandings with us but God doesn't need us. You know, God's not needy. He's not, he's not going, I'm going to create a whole system so that everybody understands me in the end. <laughs> so God hasn't created a system for that. What God's created the system for is that you all come to understand yourself in the end. Yeah. And that's the beautiful gift of God's love too. God's love is not selfish. It's not motivated by what God wants. It's motivated by what God wants for us. Right? So this whole concept, this new age concepts that exist nowadays of you know, God split himself into billions of pieces so that all of us could experience God. I don't believe in any of those concepts and I've never believed in any of those concepts. In fact, the more of God's love I receive, the less I accept that such a concept is possible. But I do believe that it is possible that God is going to teach us how to be like God in far more ways than we currently can conceive. So I do believe it's possible that God is going to teach us to actually have children of our own that are souls, not, not, not physical bodies, but souls that we create, that have two halves. God will show us how to create two halves of a soul that's pure and pristine in its nature and create billions of them. I believe that God will do that. I don't know for certain, but that's what I currently believe. Does that make sense? So, so I believe that a lot of things are going to be possible in the future, but, but it's all dependent on five things developed within ourselves. And unless we do that, understanding everything else is impossible. And I know that for certain. Because I, I know that the people who have not developed those particular things and received God's love do not understand anything like what I currently understand or have understood for the last 2,000 years. They have no understanding at all, in fact, many of them. They, they think they do, but they have none. Right? And that, they are people who are very happy. They're still very happy. They're in the sixth dimension, very happy people, but, but they don't understand hardly anything about God's universe. It's only when you receive God's love that you start to understand fully God's universe. Yeah. And that's why it's so important. That's why it's the first thing I teach. And the only thing I really want to teach at this point even. Yeah. So does that answer your question? A bit of a long-winded answer in the end. Thanks. So this must be our last question. And this could be a question even for tomorrow, mm-hmm. leading into tomorrow. Um, 
What if we just turn off the other mics? Um, so your, what mic do you say, is it say it on yours? Your one? So if you still talk, can I, can I still hear you? Say it again. Hand it Handheld one. one. Okay, that's mm -hmm. good. So just turn on this. That cuts down one possibility, at least. <clears throat> Far away. So I was, um, <clears throat> I was just actually really moved by what Mary shared. And, um, you know, when we think back, I, when I think back, or millions and millions of people to the life of Jesus in the first century, we could read in the Bible, what it, what the teachings and some of the descriptions of that life, but we don't know what, we, we weren't with you, mm -hmm. so we couldn't see you in action. We couldn't see love in action. No. And, um, you know, again, we watch videos and day and night, <clears throat> and we get a feel, and there's a feeling that comes from that, and a yeah. very powerful feeling. Yeah. And I'm imagining it can facilitate some change or some some inner reflection to do the work, but, um, um, you know, I could say uh, what, what came to my mind in kind of a funny way was, you know, the, the making is a, re a new reality show, you know, the camera crew's in your home, kind of tracking you guys around all day long, mm -hmm. uh, or those who have had the chance to live with you, experience you in action, that could be a, a blessing for them or it could be a nightmare for them, yep. I, I'm imagining. So w part of my question was... Uh, Mary to, could answer that the best. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> yeah. But uh, maybe just to... Um, uh, I, would, I would love to hear Mary at some point maybe share a little bit about some of what she has experienced in her day-to-day -day actions. What, what love has looked like for her, maybe that was totally unexpected because when I, like I think of my own life um, in some of the things you said today, um, I consider myself a very loving person, very loving. Yep. I've also had real difficulty in being in love. Uh, I've had a, a huge amount of heartache and pain around, so I know there are tremendous blocks. But one of the things, that, like my conception of what being loving is you were saying was is basically agreeing with it what everybody else says my parents yeah. being the people pleaser that i i'm sure I, those are my strategies when i was growing up to yeah. gain acceptance but is that really love i mean i'm a loving guy but is that really love and do i even really know what love is uh, i i don't i don't even know if i know yeah. um so i i guess i'm just feeling very humble right now yeah that um well, what if tomorrow, Mary, I'm sure would love to answer your question and give you some personal reflection. So she's had, obviously, six years we've been together now, so she gets to see me every day. We, we spend very little time apart, so um, she gets to see me every day, all day, every day, pretty much, aside from when we were asleep, and even then we spend a lot of time together in the sleep state. So... Um, I'm sure Mary would love to answer you tomorrow about that subject, so maybe if we could start that. But if I can just give some reflections sure. yeah. myself. Um, our concepts of love are greatly determined by how we were brought up. And for the majority of people on earth, there is this feeling that a person who loves you will always agree with you. But if you think about it from God's perspective, that's totally impossible. Because God knows a whole heap of things that, that you don't know. So God can't agree with you. <laughs> but God still loves you. So the reality is, agreeing with someone isn't love. God doesn't agree with most of us here on earth, doesn't agree with most of our actions, but still loves us. God still has compassion for us, still has understanding and empathy for us, but, and still loves us, but doesn't agree with us doesn't agree with our actions, doesn't agree with our decisions. God allows us to make such decisions because God gave us the gift of free will. But God doesn't agree when our decisions are out of harmony with love. And we know that God doesn't agree because God made a whole heap of laws that mean that if you break them, you have certain compensatory effects that occur that correct you. So that tells you that God doesn't agree. Now, if 
Our whole life has been planned around making everybody around us happy, making everybody around us feel comfortable, making everybody around us feel agreeable, and making them feel that we are agreeable, then that's not love. That is an addiction being met for a reason. And this is something that most people believe about me. They believe that the Jesus of the first century was just an agreeable chappy, right? who basically agreed with everybody. Mind you, the Bible itself contradicts such thought. You've got things like Matthew 23, Matthew 22 and 23, talking about how I was addressing the Pharisees, which, by the way, I did do. I was pretty straight with them about what was right, what was wrong, and, the reason, and their own condition, in fact. I was very straight with them about that. So being loving doesn't necessarily mean you will agree with everyone and it doesn't mean that you will pander to everybody's concept of themselves or concept of reality. My concept in the first century of reality was very, very different to everyone else's. It was far more in harmony with God's concept of reality, but everyone around me disagreed with me about it. Most of the disciples disagreed with me pretty constantly about my treatment of Mary even. Just a very simple thing like that. Most of the disciples, particularly the male ones, but even most of the female ones, disagreed that I should treat Mary the way I treated her in the first century. So being agreeable with everybody is different than being loving with everybody. Now, I've had people come to me and say, look, you're just not a loving person. And I say, why do you think that? And they said, because... I just don't feel this feeling coming from you that enters me, that I've been to, you know, this guru in India who, who, when I went into his presence, he just showered me with love and affection. And I'm going, oh, no, here we go. This is a person, so it's not that free, it's not that free soon. I know that now. This is a person who's just feeding the addictions of the individual. And when we get our addictions met, the majority of us feel that we're loved. This is our problem. And when somebody does not meet our addictions, we feel confronted. We feel unloved. And I'm suggesting to you that God is not going to meet your addictions. And sometimes with God, you're not going to feel loved because your own concept of love is out of harmony with God and God's love. Does that make sense? And so you can't expect to always feel good on the road to getting closer to God because there will be so many things inside of you that need to be confronted that are out of harmony with love. And even the belief that if somebody meets my addictions, they love me, is actually out of harmony with love. A person who loves you will want to do everything they can to help you, but inside the boundaries of God's love and laws. They won't do it outside of the boundaries of God's love or laws. They won't compromise law. In fact, none of God's laws need to be compromised because they are all laws based on love. So God does not compromise any single law that God has with us. Right? Now you think about it from our day-to-day -day interactions with others. We often compromise. We think a compromise is love, even. But God doesn't compromise ever. Right? So compromise is not love. Compromise is driven by other emotions. A desire for agreement, a desire to avoid violence, a desire to avoid anger, a desire to not confront a person's emotional condition, and many other emotions which are out of harmony with love. So... There's a difference between compromise and open-mindedness as well. A person who's in a state of love is always has an open mind, always willing to analyse new things, listen to a person's position and so forth. Of course, only when those particular things, listening to a person, is in harmony with love of themselves and love of the person. So if a person's yelling and screaming at me, I don't listen to them. doesn't matter what they're saying. <laughs> I don't have to listen to them because they're out of harmony with love when they're delivering. Now, if they're yelling and screaming at me, like they're my, one of my sons yelling and screaming at me because sometime in the past I did something to harm them, then I will listen to them. 
because I know that it's partly my responsibility. But if they're just yelling and screaming at me because they have some different opinion and I don't accept it, then why would I listen to such a thing? When they attack me, when they try to pull me down, when they try to belittle me, when they try to make fun of me, when they try to be condescending towards me, it's all an attack. Love doesn't accept those things. If you're condescending with God, do you think God goes, oh, yes, I must be terrible because, you know, AJ thought I was terrible, so I must be terrible. God doesn't do that. God doesn't change her opinion of herself to suit our opinion of God. When you become at one with God, you won't do that either. You won't change your opinion of yourself to suit other people's opinion of you. And you won't be afraid of violence. You won't be afraid of attack. You won't be afraid of any of these things when you become at one with God. And so many of the reasons why we do things on earth that other people consider as loving are actually driven by our fear rather than love. And this is the real key part, I feel, of understanding love. There is no fear in love. Now, ironically, the Bible actually says that. If you look in 1 John 4.18, that's what it says. Fear, love sets fear aside, is the statement it makes. There is no fear in love. So whenever fear dominates the reason why you choose to do something, it's not love anymore. There's some other reason. There's some other thing dominating rather than love. And it's fear that there will be addictions involved in fear and many other things involved in fear, anger involved in fear and so forth. When people live with me, um, and so Mary, as I, she can make her comments tomorrow about this, when people live with me, they don't get many of their addictions met. And this causes them, many of them, to believe that I don't love them. Right? Because many of us have grown up thinking that if we, somebody meets our addictions, then they love us. And when people live with me, I don't meet many of their addictions. And in fact, my, my goal is to meet none of their addictions. <laughs> That's my goal. But of course, I've not perfected that yet. But my goal is to meet none of their addictions. Or my own addictions, for that matter. None of my own either. And, and when I do that with people, then there's a lot of emotional responses, which vary from rage sometimes violent rage, right the way through to grief. There's a whole series of emotions that people have as a result. And even my acceptance of their grief causes many people to believe that I don't love them. In other words, they feel that I should help them get rid of their grief somehow. Somehow I've got to you know, magically wave my wand, <laughs> which I don't have, and make their grief disappear. And I can't do that. I know from my own experience that grief has to be experienced to, be dis to disappear. So many people get confronted with all of those particular things. And I'm sure when Mary talks to you tomorrow about how, what her personal experience has been, um, she, she will mention many of the things that I've just said about the confrontations that occur. On the other hand... I am not selfish in the way in which I demonstrate things to others. So in other words, with Mary, for example, I am not trying to get my own needs met, ever. I'm not focused on, you know, what is my wants and how Mary should meet them. Right? That, doesn't, that doesn't even, it's not a part of my consideration. I have a desire to give my gift of love to Mary in as many ways as I possibly can. And I have a desire to receive love from Mary, but not um, a demand to receive it. What just came to my awareness is that I think so much of my or our, our collective conception of God and what God's love means is basically a desire to feed our addictions, just to give us everything we want. That's what we want. What, I, I, I need more money. I, I need, need more, more money, so sex, God should give I it. I need more love. I need more this. Yeah. And, uh, and if you think about religion today, it does promote that belief to a, to a fairly large degree. That there is this belief. I find it quite remarkable, actually, that there is this belief in most religious faiths that if you pray to God for something, God should give it to you. 
And they forget the if. Because what I said is, if you pray in my name, you will receive. Mm. And what did I mean by that? I meant, if you pray understanding that you have to do things in harmony with God's laws, you will receive. So that's a big if. Right? The majority of people on earth when they pray don't pray considering that if. What they do is they long for God to receive something. They don't consider whether it's in or out of harmony with God's love to give it. And when they do that, when they don't receive it from God, what do they do? They get all angry and bitter with God. Or they believe God doesn't exist or whatever, you know, whatever other assumption they make. God's not like that. God is only going to do for us what is in harmony with God's love. Every time. So when, we often want things out of harmony with God's love. Yeah. So, you know, there's sometimes we want a relationship with a certain person. From God's perspective, God wants you to have a relationship with your soulmate. And that person might not be your soulmate. So God's not going to assist you to create a relationship out of harmony with what God's love has created already. God's going to allow you to do it. But God's not going to assist you to do it. That's just a simple example. There's many other examples we could give. So I feel that many of us misunderstand God's nature and characteristics and personality. And one of the things that I'm trying to do through my example with you is to help you have more faith in God's nature and personality and help you understand more about what God's love does so that you have some faith in it. And I feel one of the best gifts that any person can give you is by their own example show you something. Yeah. And, and that's what we are attempting to do. And at the moment there's 13 or 14. There's 14 who came. One has passed. There's 13 of us left. And at the moment two or three of us are trying. Three of us. Sorry about that. There's another one. Three of us are so trying to start to demonstrate these principles too. And I say trying because I'm still trying to demonstrate these principles. I have not yet gone through my own clearing of my own fears to complete that process. But once that does happen, and I'm very, very confident based on what I know about God's love, not about myself, that it's going to occur. Once that happens, you will have a living example again just like the first century people had a living example, of what is possible for you. But I'm not going to be able to do it for you. And no matter what I say, it's not really going to help you. Because the only thing that's really going to help you is for you to go through the process of receiving God's love yourself and be willing to look through the blockages yourself. Well, what I'm, what I'm seeing right now is just that <clears throat> the way God's love shows up in my life is by the circumstances and the events that show up in my face yep. every day yep. and every moment and that I haven't been willing to see those as an expression of love. Yes. I get pissed off. I get angry. Uh, that's not what I want. I didn't ask for this crap. <laughs> yes. And, uh, yeah, so, yep. yeah. No, no, you're dead right. You're dead right. That's how most of us see law of attraction events that actually have been created by our own soul. We actually see them as impositions upon our life rather than a gift of God's love to our life. And once we start seeing them differently, we'll start reacting them to them differently. So, yeah, I feel there's a, it's a very good question you've asked. So perhaps what we need to do, Mary and I will write down that question this evening and Mary will give you some answers tomorrow about what she finds about what she's learnt through the process. And... Um, We've also done recently, wasn't it with, uh, was it with Jeff Whitehead? We did an interview, Living in Truth Session 2 is what it's called on the net. Um, and that he asked us a lot of personal questions about our day-to-day -day life as well in that, in that interview, um, which a person could also examine if you wanted to about just how we feel and how we react and how we deal with certain situations. Because I, I have not, I'm still got fear, so that means occasionally I still get angry, and it also means um, occasionally I'm still afraid, you know, uh, and sometimes um, I feel tempted. I don't 
try to act in harmony with it, but I feel tempted to, just like you do. Um, so, you know, and Mary knows the results of all of those things, what happens in our day-to-day -day life. We are also under a lot of spirit attack, at naturally being the people who are leading a certain thing, leading a certain process, you come under a lot of spirit attack. And when I say lot, you know, I mean millions and millions of people trying to attack you at any one point in time. And so we feel that attack quite frequently. And so we can also talk about how to deal with those attacks. Because I actually see those attacks as a gift as well. They, they are telling me everything that's left over in me to address. Because once I've let go of everything, there is no way any person physically or spiritually can attack me. They can kill my body, but they can't harm me in any, in any emotional way or phys physical way that is a, of any importance. Yeah. So, um, you know, all I see is that as a gift. So when you get an attack, what do you see it as? As an attack, right? And usually it's something that you want to defend, right? In other words, attack back. You know, your government's real good at that here, isn't it, in the States. Like, well, you even now have what's called preemptive attack. Like, if someone's going to attack you, you attack them instead. You get in first, right? And uh, that's not the way I deal with attack. The way I deal with attack is I allow the attack to occur and see it as a gift to help me work through something that I need to work through. Once I've worked through those particular things, um, I feel that I won't receive that as an attack anymore. So while other people might still want to do it, but I won't feel it as an attack. At the moment, I feel it as an attack, just like you do. But I don't react to it. I don't, uh, you know, I don't react in the same manner that the average person reacts to it. Because I've learnt the lesson. Every time I get angry back, get violent back, or whatever it is, damage to my soul that I'm going to have to clear later. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to cause myself more damage. I want to get rid of the damage I already have. Yeah. So we'll answer those, some of those questions tomorrow. That'd be, that'd be fine. We just need to find a, another operator for Mary's camera. <laughs> I think we've got one, so we should be right. Thank you. No worries. Thank you for your time today, guys. The noise around us is going to substantially increase in a, in a minute, so we probably should finish off there. And... Uh, we are starting again at 11 in the morning um, and we'll probably go to around about four-ish or so, I think we've planned or booked to, haven't we? Just one thing before we go that I'd like to do is just thank those people who have organised this event. So Kristen is one of those persons. She's behind the camera here. We've got Barbara. Can you just stand up, Barbara? Yeah. And we've got... Uh, Liz as well, and we have um, Pamela as well, who've been involved in some things. Now they have also, um, there's been donations that have come, of course, to pay for Mary and I to come here. We don't have the funds to come overseas generally by ourselves, so um, we'd like to thank all of those people who have donated. I think there is a little donation way of donating up the back there somewhere that's been hastily con constructed. Um, if you wish to donate, uh, we're happy to receive your donations. They'll be up the back there. What we're going to do is actually pass those donations on to the people who have paid for uh, the event. And we, if there's money left over, then that will come to us at some point. So what we like to do first is pay the people who have been put in their own funds. And then once we've paid those people, um, what they do with their payment is up to them. <laughs> some of them re-donate it sometimes, but we don't expect that. And then what's left over, Mary and I will take with us and we'll use however we see fit, to be frank. <laughs> but most of the time it's to try to spread some more of what we're teaching with others. So that's our goal. Um, I don't know if there's any other things we need to cover before we leave tonight. Um, can I Are we planning tomorrow evening to have a dinner? We were thinking about it tonight, but to be honest, we're so tired, myself and Mary. We have only had, well, Mary had a bit more sleep than I did last night, but I've only had a few hours sleep. So um, we decided that tonight we're going to have a rest. Um, 
Tomorrow, we're not sure, it's up to you guys really whether any of you would like to have that. Ourselves, we're, we're going to book into, I think tomorrow night we decided we were going to book at P.F. Chang's up by where we are, and, uh, which is about, what would it be, 10 minutes, 20 minutes drive along just two major, just two major turns really, isn't it? It's quite simple. Um, up in... Uh, what's the suburb? Plymouth. Plymouth Meeting, that's right. Up in Plymouth Meeting. That's where we're going to have dinner tomorrow night. Feel free to join us if you want to. Um, yeah, if we find that there's a lot who decide to come along, we will have to let them know in advance and book it because they do have busy weekends. Do you want to have a show of hands who might be wanting to do that? How many is that? One, two, three, one. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Corny would possibly come. Mike? So there's 22, around 22. So we get a table for 24 or something like that. Um, if we book it. We, yeah, we'll book, we'll book a table for 24 tomorrow night. It's, uh, you, you have the choice there of getting... Uh, vegetarian meals. Most of their meals are vegetarian. Uh, the, sorry, most of their meals are a mixture of all sorts of things, as they, as they are in the US. But there are very nice vegetarian meals, and most of their meals are not necessarily vegan because they occasionally use sugar that's been filtered by a bone. All refined sugar has been filtered by bone, and. And sometimes they use refined sugar in some of their dishes that are marked vegetarian. So if it wasn't for that, they'd be vegan, actually. So, but Mia and I still eat some of them because they're quite nice. But yeah, That's what we'll be doing tomorrow evening, if you like. Um, probably make it six-ish. It'll take us a good solid hour to pack up tomorrow. So we'll make it about six-ish. Any other questions? No? Thanks. Thanks for your time today, guys, and we'll see you tomorrow.